Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hey, Karen. The only first person I can see right now. I'm going to wait till seven ish. See, I'm expecting about eight people. So I'll probably, I don't like to be late, but we'll see. So, so Karen, where are you from? I am from Sausalito, so just up in Northern California, and am beyond excited about this because I love the book, the Oppenheimer book from Atheist, and saw the movie, so can't wait for this. Oh, that is so awesome, Karen. I um, Sausalito is an amazing, gorgeous place. Um, except don't you have to go to you have to go over the the Golden Gate to get there, right? You do, or you could come up over the Richmond Bridge. Got it. Through Oakland or something, right? Right. Got it. I was a cantor in um in Saratoga, California for about seven years. Oh wow. So I lived in that area, not Sausalito. <laughs> uh -oh. But in the South. Sacramento is a little warmer right now. Yeah. 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 I'm getting a glare. So I've told all my friends about this presentation. I was I'm so excited to hear this. <laughs> you are you are awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, what I'm going to ask um, people is to um, to ask me questions in the chat as we go because as a science teacher, it's not you know it's not really doing much of the science, but you may think I'm doing a lot of science, right? I don't know. And so ask me questions as we go, because I don't want to lose you and, and put you to sleep. I want it to be really interesting. And I have to admit that I did not read Prometheus. Um, I've read a lot of books on women in science. Um, that one I have not read, but it's probably fabulous. It It is. And it's, um, it's really exciting because a lot of the stuff is transcripts from the CIA, all the Secret Service transcripts right. are in there. And it's just like, you know, and learning about Jews and from Berkeley and anti-Semitism. It's just being a member of the teachers union means you're a communist, you know, it's just crazy stuff like that. And 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 history repeats itself, right? <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm going to go back even before Manhattan Project, and and we'll see that history repeats itself as well. Hi, Rosa, where are you calling in from? Columbus, oh, whoop, Columbus, Ohio. Beautiful, beautiful. So it's late for you. Look at you, dedicated. Yes, it is. It's like ten o'clock at night, right? You're on. Yeah, East that's Coast. it. That's my friend over there. Hey, oh, you're Rosa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you know each other? Yeah, each other. Oh, from um, the synagogue in Columbus, Ohio, to Ferret Israel, um, joined because of COVID from out here because oh. it provided me with so much stuff. So doing that COVID bonding over the Zooms uh -huh. was just like, it's hard to replace that kind of friendships you build during that specific time period in our lives. So yeah. So were you were you reaching um were you from Columbus Karen or you just found the synagogue 
Yeah, from um, Parkersburg, West Virginia, and then grew up in Columbus. And when our synagogue out here shut, <laughs> I was looking, I said, what am I going to do? And it was like the ra- the cantor and two rabbis singing. I'm going, oh, but they're on and they're functioning. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it was Cantor Chomsky. Do you know? I know. Uh, yes. Yes. He's <laughs> He's in Israel now, isn't he? Yes, he is. is. Yes. How funny. What a small world. Okay. Well, not really when you think of a Jew world. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Jew yeah, geography, the Jew world right? is very, Especially the conservative Jew. Like if you're in the same sex of it. Just, yeah. You know, got it. Very funny. Yeah. So he's, who's there now? There is no canter there now. We've got two rabbis, Rabbi Braver and Rabbi Skolnick. And then there are a lot of lay leaders that do afternoon and morning services, and they're there on the weekends, of course, and all during the week with classes and workshops and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's so when you so Skolnick is that um, is that the son of Jerry Skolnick? Is he the the chaplain in in the military? Yeah, well, uh, that's his yes, brother. Oh, it's his brother. Oh, I didn't. Really yeah, know. and his father just retired from. Just retired from Forest Hills. Uh, yes, <laughs> right. I know my Jewish geography. You would do well at Jewish geography. That's worth five hundred points point. right there. But now I'm at. I'm actually near Torrance, Eunice. I'm at a synagogue in um in Redondo Beach, and because mm. um, a reform synagogue, so I don't know anybody. So it's so interesting <laughs> how 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 we're so we stick to our lanes. Yeah. Well, sometimes that keeps us safe. Sometimes it makes it boring and it's always good to veer a little bit now and then. Right. right. Eunice. Hi, Eunice. Hi. <laughs> I'm here and I'm probably going to have to keep it off a little bit if the oh, dogs start, start, start yeah. acting up. Yeah. But, uh-huh. Which uh, synagogue? I'm at um, Temple Menorah. Yes. Oh. Uh-huh. I know the area. It's right by Wilderness Park. Right. It's right across the street. In fact, we're doing a combined service, all the South Bay synagogues um, this Friday night at Wilderness Park. Wow. So. Wow. So you'll have a lot of canters there. Yeah. Well, they're, that'll they're be beautiful. Yeah, it'll be great. We're going to do some some stuff together. It'll be it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm just new to the synagogue. I started in June. Um, oh. So so it's been it's been great. Well, well let's get started. Um, I don't want I, I I hate keeping people's time. It's not it's not it will, it'll take about maybe half an hour, 40 minutes. And then if you ask questions in the middle, um, then I'll, I'll stop and answer them or at the end. OK, if I forget to ask you if you have questions, because I don't think I made that slide, just just ask them anyway. OK, because sometimes I forget things. <laughs> so first of all, um, let me share my screen. I want to welcome all of you to Women of the Manhattan Project Part One. This is actually my my large goal is to do four sessions of this. Um, And and today's the first session, but you don't have to come back or you can keep coming back. Um, My name is Melanie Fine. Um, I have a degree in chemistry from Cornell, uh, a master's in sacred music and diploma of Chazan from the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. And I have a secondary teaching credential in chemistry and physics. I teach um, at Culver City High School. Um, I'm only saying that because we have so so many Californians here. (laughs) I'm a lifetime advocate of women in science and I'm the author of the Rocket Girls book series um, to inspire preteens and teenage girls in science. And you can find that at rocketgirls.com. And um, so you can buy the books either at rocketgirls.com but this link, if you get to that website, is going to get you to Amazon. So you can go directly to Amazon. Sometimes when you put in Rocket Girls and Amazon, they take you to another book. So you just have to put in my name as well. But I think here on my website, rocketgirls.com, you can get a direct link. And what's so cool about these books is that they have not only, so the, the first book, the one that's blue, um, Sam Gold of the Case of the Missing Uranium, really contains all the science that I'm gonna be going over in the next in the next few weeks. Um, at, at a kid's level, at, at a preteen, teenager level, and um, it also has home experiments that I don't know if you guys would be interested in doing, but kids would. <laughs> so if you have kids in your life. Um, so so let's, let's proceed to today's talk. How many of you have seen Oppenheimer? 
we got one. You can raise your hand in the if you're like if you're if your if video is is a you just you didn't see it. No, nope? okay. You can also raise your hand in in Zoom. I I figure we're all Zoom aficionados by now. Um, what did you think of it? What did you think of it? Those who saw it, Karen, good. You're muted. I I loved it, and I I thought it was a an amazing challenge to take the Prometheus and reduce it into only three hours. Mm -hmm. And I know that seems like a lot, but there were so many, it, it's like he really, the screenwriters really hit on almost all the topics. Oh, really? One of my favorite ones, since we're talking about women tonight was when this woman came up and she, she announced like you, like these, Ivy League schools that she was from and and she said to Oppie she said they won't let me in because I can't type but they didn't teach me that at Cornell <laughs> it was Cornell wasn't it <laughs> yeah and it was great it was just and that just immediately showed you where women were right I just had someone ask me what the password was um someone a friend of mine texted me so let me just see if I can figure that out. Um, I'm just going to um, exit full screen and see if it lets me. And then I can go on to Zoom and figure it out and then I'll be right back. Um, let me edit this. Maybe it'll let me, sorry for this. It's a brief. Um, I don't know if there is a password. Yeah, advanced. Now it's a teller. Oh, maybe it's, let me just put this in and then we'll go. 297225, I think. Okay, let's see that. Okay, so let's, um, go back and there's a um, but yeah so Susanna is saying it was an awesome movie amazing man brilliant but aware of effects on humanity and the world terrific I'm going to go back to the screen here go back to the slideshow um so I saw it on the very first day it opened I was so looking forward to it um uh, so I saw it July 21st in the morning. It was Friday. Um, it was a little long, but it didn't disappoint. Um, and yes, very few women were depicted in the film, but I knew that going in. I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that there'd be many women uh, depicted in the film. Were there women who worked on the Manhattan Project? Yes. Were they a majority or even half of the scientific community? Not even close. But the way I see it, it was a missed opportunity um, because for example, oh wait, here she comes. I heard someone coming in, I just don't know how to invite them. Oh, here it is, okay, good. The way I see it was a missed opportunity like the film Selma was a missed opportunity by retelling the story of King's March on Selma without the accompaniment of prominent American rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel alongside of him. So just like it missed that opportunity, it's not that it's not that it, that um, you have to you have to put someone in there. They just missed telling that part of the story. And so I think Oppenheimer missed that as well. Um, there were very prominent women scientists who helped make the Manhattan Project a success. And there even were women without whom the Manhattan Project would have been an impossibility. Over these four weeks, my goal is to reinsert women into the narrative, not artificially, not by exaggerating their contributions, but by telling the story as it happened, the true story of the Manhattan Project. And to tell the story of the Manhattan Project, we have to actually go back way before it and way outside the United States, because you see nuclear physics, the study of the atom, was almost exclusively a European pursuit. So to properly tell the story, let's go back to the 19th century. To this gentleman, Lord Kelvin, 
Lord Kelvin was a British uh, mathematician and physicist who was born in Ireland and lived most of his professional life in Scotland. And he came up with the first and second laws of thermodynamics and the temperature scale, the Kelvin temperature scale was named after him. The story goes that in 1900, Lord Kelvin addressed the British Association for the Advancement of Science, I'm gonna call it the BOSS or the BASS, with these words, there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now, all that remains is more and more precise measurement. So in 1900, he says, there's nothing new to be discovered in physics. Now you can find this quote all over the web. Um, what you cannot find though, is actually any evidence that he actually said this, but it is all over the web. I will tell you a quote that actually does exist, that actually is written down. This is by, um, by Albert Mickelson, um, half of the Mickelson-Morley experiment. In 1894, okay, 1894, he wrote, the future truths of physical science are to be looked for in the sixth place of decimals. In other words, he's saying the exact same thing. Everything's been discovered, and now we're focusing on more precise measurements. So we know for sure that Mickelson wrote this latter quote, and we and most likely Kelvin never said the former quote, though whether or not he said it or didn't say it or someone else said it or didn't say it, let's consider the hubris of the belief that all of physics had been discovered by 1894. Because look what happened after 1894. Let's just go one year later, um, 1895, because look what was discovered on November 8th of 1895. On this day, German physicist Wilhelm Röntgen discovered X-rays, giving them the name of X, why? Because he didn't know what they were made of, so he called them X, X-rays. Um, by the way, this is the very first human X-ray. This is the X-ray of his wife, Bertha's hand. Um, X-rays became the hot new thing a year after uh, Mickelson said what he said. We thought of calling it a... Say it again. No. Oh. Sorry. I I thought we were muted. Sorry about yeah, that. No problem. Uh, so X-rays were the big thing. Doctors use X-rays to see people's skeletal structures, their organs, to cure lesions, to treat cancer. They're still using it to treat cancer really to treat any medical problem they had been unable to at that point. And the public, the public went mad for Rentgen's little x-rays. As such, x-rays were used extensively for entertainment. People could even buy or build their own x-ray machines at home. Early use of x-rays was widespread and unrestrained, even to the degree that during the 1930s and 1940s, shoe stores offered free x-rays of your foot to see how it fit in the shoe. This is actually an X-ray of uh, Tesla's foot, by the way, in his shoe. Um, and protection from radiation, no one knew any better. In fact, would you believe that to adjust the strength of an X-ray, this is how X-ray uh, technicians work, to adjust the strength of the X-ray, they would aim it at their arm and crank it up until their arm started to tingle. So this was 1895. Um, in 1896, French physicist Henri Becquerel was so excited with these x-rays and was intrigued that they can cause certain materials to become phosphorescent, to glow, like glow in the dark. This was right up Becquerel's alley as his father had spent his lifetime studying phosphorescence and the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Henri Becquerel wondered, is that why phosphorescent materials glow? Do they glow because they're emitting x-rays? So to test this, Becquerel obtained some materials which do phosphoresce. In other words, they glow after being exposed to light. He conducted some experiments in which he put the phosphorescent materials, phosphorescent materials, excuse me, out in the sun to get them to glow. And then he set them on top of a photographic plate that was wrapped in black paper to catch the rays only coming from the object that was exposed to the sun. Becquerel obtained mixed results, but that wasn't the most important part. You see, one of the phosphorescent substances he used was a uranium salt. We know something about uranium already, but he didn't know it was a uranium salt, it was phosphorescent. And he planned to take the uranium salts and expose it to the sun, but it was a cloudy day in France. Um, you know, I guess maybe it was raining, it was a cloudy day. So he kept it in the drawer with the wrapped photographic plate. The next day when the sun came out, he was going to expose it to the sun and do his test with the uranium salts. But he had a thought, why don't I just develop it now and see what we get? And so the only thing that, that exposed the photographic plate was this uranium salt. And when he developed it, this is a picture of it. When he developed it, he saw these images on the plate that had no other light source 
than the uranium salts, but the uranium salts had not been exposed to sunlight. So where did that light come from? Because phosphorescent materials don't glow until you actually add light to them. We know we've had all those glow in the dark things as kids or for our kids where we put them, at, we have to put them out in the sun and then we put them in a dark room and we see them glow. But these uranium salts weren't anywhere near the sun. Becquerel called a, this a new uh, radiation. He called it uranic rays, U-R-A-N-I-C rays coming from uranium. Um, and they were also called Becquerel rays. So this was 1896, one year after X-rays were discovered. The thing was, it was sheer accident that the glow-in-the-dark compound Becquerel used was uranium. And it was sheer whim that Becquerel decided to develop his unexposed photographic plates anyway. And oh, what a Pandora's box he opened. Again, nothing to see here. As we know, there's nothing new to be discovered in physics after 1900. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. Becquerel's in work piqued the interest of our first um, woman of the Manhattan Project of a newly married chemistry student in Paris who was trying to come up with original research in pursuit of her doctorate. She was a Polish national named Maria Sladowski Curie. After working as a governess to put her older sister through school, it was now her turn. Maria Sladowska Curie, better known as Marie Curie, had scored highest in the Sorbonne's science license exam and second highest in its mathematics exam. Of course, much of her preparation was self-taught as girls' schools were not intended to prepare women for university and other seats of higher learning. Marie wanted to do research on something new and off the beaten path that other people weren't researching. And oddly enough, Becquerel's work on uranic rays he was also uh, in Paris, so that might have had something to do with it. Um, it was not popular. What was popular at the time besides x-rays was electricity, which in 1889 was able to power the elevators of the Eiffel Tower, and in 1891 replaced the gas street lamps in Paris, as well as the telephone, indoor plumbing, thank God, the electrification of streetcars, the introduction of standard time, bicycles, and the steam-powered engine, and of course, x-rays. So Becquerel's rays were where Marie started. She decided she'd do her doctoral work on measuring these rays. More specifically, it was known by then that these Becquerel rays actually electrified the air. So Marie Curie set about measuring precisely how electrified the air got. When she tested pitch blend, which was the, 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 the ore from which uranium was mined, she found that it electrified or ionized the air stronger than uranium itself correctly surmising that there must be another element in pitch blend that produced even more Becquerel rays than uranium. By now, she had convinced her husband Pierre to abandon his research and help her with extracting this new element from pitch blend. They pulverized pitch blend, attacked it with chemicals, and married the, excuse me, measured the activity or the Becquerel rays of the product. When they obtained products that were more active than uranium, they continued to break that product down using as many techniques as they could muster, attacking it with chemicals, distilling it, etc. You see, in order to identify a new element, you need a pure enough sample to be able to measure its atomic mass and its spectral lines. Though each generation of extraction got them closer to this new as yet unknown metal, they couldn't get a sample that was pure enough that wasn't mixed with other metals. It took them eight months to obtain a pure enough sample, and Marie named this new, more active element than uranium, polonium, after her mother country, Poland. And she introduced the term, this term came from her, radioactive, to describe it. Polonium was 400 times as radioactive as uranium, and then it took another three years to isolate another element in the pitch blend that was 900 times as radioactive as uranium, which they named radium. Marie Curie was, would become the first woman to receive the Nobel Prize, which she was awarded along with her husband, Pierre, and Henri Becquerel for the discovery of radioactivity. Until the discovery of radioactivity, two forces sufficed to explain all the phenomena occurring in nature, gravity and electromagnetism, which is light. Now there was a third, radioactivity. Marie Curie was convinced that radioactivity is a property of the atomic nature of matter, but the jury was still out at the time on whether there was such a thing as an atom. And it was actually due to the discovery of radioactivity that scientists would finally be able to agree on the existence of the atom, and more than that, determine what was inside. Yet again, nothing to see here. After all, the future truths of physical science are to be looked for in the sixth place of decimals. 
Unfortunately, on a rainy day in April 1906, Pierre Curie slipped and fell under a heavy horse-drawn wagon, killing him instantly. The loss of Pierre devastated Marie for her entire life, and it was mostly through her scientific work that she was able to channel the pain of losing him. Marie took over Pierre's teaching position at the Sorbonne, which was unheard of for a woman to do. Even upon earning a second Nobel Prize in 1911, this time in chemistry for her discovery of radium and polonium, she had a really tough go at it. First, she was considered a foreigner because she was born in Poland, and the xenophobia in France at the turn of the century was at an all-time high. France was still reeling from the Dreyfus affair. French artillery officer Alfred Dreyfus, who was Jewish, was convicted of treason in 1894 and sentenced to life in prison. Even though two years later, it was discovered that he did not commit the crime, he was not granted a new trial until 1899. And the second trial actually divided the French society into the erudite, more liberal supporters of Dreyfus and a pro-army, mostly Catholic group who maintained his guilt, even against evidence that proved he was innocent. Dreyfus was ultimately exonerated in 1906 and reinstated in the French army. Second, after Pierre's passing, she had a relationship with their close mutual friend, Paul Langevin, who was in a miserable marriage, and she bore the public's lopsided guilt and disapproval of this relationship. You see, married men in, Fran in France, in Paris especially, were expected to have other women on the side. Marie, on the other hand, was considered a homewrecker. And lastly, most significantly, she was a woman. Because of her gender, many believed that it was her husband, Pierre, who had done all the science and she was just his lowly assistant. And even though she was the recipient of a Nobel Prize, she was never elected into the French Academy of Sciences, try as she might. In fact, within months of being denied entry, she won her second Nobel Prize. It would take a very, 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 very long time for the French Academy of Sciences to admit a woman into its ranks. In fact, the first full, uh, full status female member was, was admitted to the Academy in 1979, 1979. So that's, that's, that's hard to fathom. Technically, I thought I had a picture. No, I guess I don't have a picture. I'm going to go backwards. Oops, I'm going to go backwards and I'm going forwards. Let me just do this again. Technically, Marie Curie was not involved with the Manhattan Project. She died in 1934, and she died because of pernicious anemia that was the result of her lifelong work with radioactive substances. Again, there were no protections back then. In fact, no one knew any better. Still, Marie Curie is the founding mother of the Manhattan Project. Without her, it would have taken many more years to understand radioactivity, and most likely would have shifted the timeline on scientific research during World War II. But there's actually at least one other mother of the Manhattan Project, if not two, and I'll get to them in a minute. Let's first finish up the timeline of Marie Curie's work and its contribution to 20th century science by talking about what exactly radioactivity is. There was an ongoing dispute of what matter was made of. Most scientists at the time believed that matter was made of atoms, but they believed that all atoms of the same element were identical and different from atoms of other elements and that atoms were immutable. In other words, they they did not change. Marie Curie helped change that belief. She strongly believed that radioactivity came from the atomic structure of an atom and that there must be particles inside the atom that cause this phenomenon. And that's where Ernest Rutherford picked up. He was a New Zealand born physicist who did his work first at McGill University in Canada and then at Cambridge in England. He took the radioacti radioactivity mantle from Marie Curie. He used the alpha particles coming out of uranium, the, the radioactivity coming out of uranium, to determine that the atom was indeed made of smaller parts. Um, J.J. Thompson had already discovered the electrons, but Rutherford discovered the positively charged nucleus. Here's a picture of Marie Curie at the 1911 Solvay Conference in Brussels. These are all physicists at the time. It's easy to spot her. She's the only one without a mustache. Standing right above her is Ernest Rutherford, and you might recognize a very young, very young Albert Einstein as well, 1911. And then I have to think, who is this guy? Doesn't he look Photoshopped in? There's something, he doesn't look like he's sitting at the table. I think he must have been pasted in later. Anyway, I don't know who he is. <laughs> so 
It was believed that radioactivity was the literal disintegration of the nucleus. In radioactive atoms, particles would leave the nucleus, turning the atom into another atom altogether. What gives any element its identity is its atomic number, the number of protons in the nucleus. When nuclei disintegrate and some protons escape the nucleus, the identity of the atom changes. For example, consider the long-held holy grail of the alchemist, turning lead into gold. When you look at the periodic table and find lead, which is PB, you see it has an atomic number of 82. That means it has 82 protons in its nucleus. If one proton le leaves uh, lead's nucleus, its atomic number becomes 81 and its identity becomes thallium, TL. If it lead lo loses two protons, its atomic number becomes 80, which is the atomic number of mercury. Lead would actually become mercury by losing two protons. And then the piece de resistance, if lead lost three protons, it would indeed become gold. It would have an atomic number of 79. So there is a radio radioactive pathway to turn lead into gold. The thing is, only radioactive atoms lose particles out of their nuclei, and they do this because they're unstable. They leak particles in order to form a more stable union, uh, I mean a more stable nucleus. Most atoms are stable and therefore not radioactive. Rutherford also identified two different particles that leak from atoms, the alpha particle and the beta particle. So here's alpha decay. So you've got a nucleus. Okay, this is, is um, radium. Radium gives off an alpha particle, which means its atomic number decreases by two, forming radon. And I'll show you this on the periodic table. So here's radium. When radium gives off an alpha particle that contains two protons, it becomes the gas radon. That's alpha decay. Beta decay, in be so, so in alpha decay, the, it becomes an element that is two protons fewer than the, than, than the, the parent element. In beta decay, the, the atomic number actually increases by one. So here's cesium giving off a beta particle, which really is an electron in the nucleus, and its atomic number increases by one. So in this case, cesium becomes barium by gaining, by losing an alpha, uh, excuse me, by losing a beta particle. So remember, um, by the way, that um, the future truths of physical science are to be looked for in the sixth place of decimals, but here we've actually learned how to change one element into another. By the way, Rutherford received the 1908 Nobel Prize for his discovery of the alpha and beta, and beta particles. Um, from that point on, all nuclear chemists were, and physicists were hoping, when they were hoping to discover a new element and win the Nobel Prize, they always looked two protons fewer or one proton past it um, to find their new elements. Much of the research work was done with uranium and many scientists claimed to discover what were called transuranic elements, elements that were had a higher atomic number than, than uranium, which had an atomic number of 92. This led some scientists to completely pass over the greatest discovery of the 20th century that was yet, still yet to come. So again, the future um, of physical science is only in the places of decimals, and yet discovered after 1894 were x-rays, radioactivity, the atom and its nucleus, and the contents of the atom, protons, neutrons, and electrons. But wait, there's more. Let me just check the chat. When it becomes a gas, does it become less stable? No, it's the stability is, uh, so gas, so it's sort of like water. Water is my best example of knowing what a water, what a, a solid liquid and a gas are. Solid water is ice, liquid water is water, and gaseous water is like steam, we call it steam. It doesn't make it any difference in stability, it's about what temperature it's at. Every, every element, every compound, can in some circumstances exist in any of the three states. That doesn't make it more unstable. The stability happens to, to do with the nucleus. I didn't want to, I didn't um, go deep, I didn't want to go deeply into this, but I can in the next lesson. The stability is the ratio of the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And when atoms get too big, like uranium, it's got a nucleus of 92 protons and, and maybe even more than that neutrons, it becomes like this oversized huge water balloon that has way too much water in it. It can't withstand its own weight, its own mass, so it, it falls apart. Um, there are definitely smaller elements, even like hydrogen two, hydrogen three is, 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 um, is unstable. Um, and they, 
they don't necessarily break apart, but they leak out particles in order to become stable to get that, that ratio of protons and neutrons to some kind of stability. Um, and that's the purpose of radioactivity is to leak out particles until it becomes stable. Um, so that was a great question. Um, so in 1906, um, we know that Pierre Curie was killed. And three years after that, Marie Curie had won her um, second Nobel Prize. Um, and in that year, oh, is it three? I'm sorry, it's three years after Marie Curie had won her first Nobel Prize in 1906. A Jewish woman was graduated from the University of Vienna with a PhD in physics. And that woman was Lisa Meitner. She grew up in Austria. She was not religious. Her great grandfather was a rabbi. He would he would leave challahs at people's doors who couldn't afford them before Shabbat. But she was, you know, she grew up in the 19th century or the 20th century. She was not religious. And in fact, at some point during her profession, she actually did convert, I think, to Protestantism. Um, but I think it was a it was an academic uh, move, uh, a societal move, because she wasn't active in in any religion, so to speak. But she was born Jewish. Growing up in Austria in the 1800s, education was not deemed necessary or important to women past the age of 14. Women did not attend university. The local University of Vienna, in fact, was closed to women until 1897, when Lisa was already 19 years old. Whereas the high school curriculum prepared boys to pass the college entrance exams, women had no such pre preparation or entry point. Lisa Meitner determined to enroll in university anyway, so she engaged a private tutor to pass the entrance exams. She passed and matriculated at the University of Vienna in October 1901 and chose physics as her major. Being only the second woman to graduate the University of Vienna in physics, there was no professional pathway toward an academic career for a woman, rendering the job prospects for a woman with a PhD in physics non-existent. In fact, her only opportunity if she stayed in Vienna was to teach French. And so she decided to move to Berlin because she didn't want to become a French teacher with her PhD in physics. Uh, she moved to Berlin and she audited Max Planck's physics classes, whose work on the quantum theory would later earn him a Nobel Prize in 1918. It was there that she met Otto Hahn. Her professional collaboration with Otto Hahn, Lisa Meitner was a physicist, Otto Hahn was a chemist, their collaboration would, ex would extend for more than 30 years until the night of July 13th, 1938, though arguably at least six months longer, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Both Meitner and Hahn were experimenting with this new and burgeoning field of radioactivity. And whereas Hahn needed someone to explain the mathematics and physics, Meitner needed a chemist to prepare the radioactive materials. The one snag in their collaboration was that Emil Fischer, um, the Nobel Prize recipient and chair of the chemistry department at the University of Berlin would not allow women into his laboratory for fear that they would set their hair on fire. So Otto Hahn set up a lab for Lisa in a former carpenter's shop in the university's basement. Lisa Meitner was finally doing the physics she loved, though in a basement, and banned from any other part of the institute. And it sort of goes without saying, though I will say so, she did this without pay. The university was such a male-oriented place that when she needed to use the bathroom, she had to walk to the restaurant down the street. When members of the chemistry department would walk by both Otto Hahn and Lisa Meitner, they would make a point to address him alone, good day, Herr Hahn, and purposefully ignore her. The physics department, however, was another matter. Lisa Meitner developed close lifelong friendships among her physics colleagues. She was a frequent guest at Max Planck's home where many of the greatest physicists of the time congregated, often serenaded by Planck on the piano and Albert Einstein on the violin. In 1912, Otto Hahn was offered a professorship of radioactivity at the new Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry in Berlin and asked Lisa Meitner to join him, though again without title or salary. Max Planck, in an effort to give her equal footing, actually hired her as his assistant, making her the first woman, assist, woman assistant in Berlin and giving her that first rung on the academic ladder, which had up until that point been closed to women. Because of this promotion, Meitner was able to not only join Hahn at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, but to do so at a salaried position similar to his. At the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, Meitner and Hahn would collaborate for another 26 years. Meitner and Hahn were using radioactivity to discover new elements on the periodic table. They weren't the only ones. In fact, there were four centers in the world that were competing on this frontier. Lisa Meitner and Otto Hahn, obviously in Germany, Rutherford in England, 
Irene Joliot Curie, Marie Curie's daughter, by the way, and in, in France and, um, and her husband, Frederick in France and Enrico Fermi in Italy. Enrico Fermi was in um, Oppenheimer, in the movie Oppenheimer. The methods the various groups used were all variations on a theme. Scientists would fire particles at a radioactive source such as uranium and identify the elements that were produced. The particles fired at the radio radioactive source were usually alpha particles. The chemist's job here was crucial. They would have to separate all the elements that were produced in the reaction, what are known as decay products, and identify them. The physicists would then figure out the mechanisms of how it happened. Recall that scientists at the time thought that they could increase the atomic number of uranium by making it emit a beta particle, which would create a new element, element 93. And then theoretically, they could build on that and make element 94 and so on. I'm just gonna check the chat. Yes, the bathroom exclusion was, it was that's when I, I had watched hidden figures or read hidden figures first and then learned this about Lisa Meitner. It was definitely a very similar theme, right? You know, let's not even go into black physicists at this stage. Um, any any woman at this point was not was not uh, was not well loved. Um, the physicists, so the chemists would prepare the materials. The physicists would figure out the mechanisms of how it happened. Recall that scientists at the time thought that they could increase the atomic number of uranium. Well, I talked about this already by emitting a beta particle. So for quite some time, scientists believed that by bombarding elements with alpha particles or neutrons, they would create these transuranic elements, these new elements that were heavier than uranium. And why were they so interested in this? They felt that if they could find a new element, they would get a Nobel Prize. Um, it was during these studies that Meitner and Hahn actually discovered a sub-uranium element named protactinium in 1917. After the First World War, Meitner was promoted to full professorship and as such created the physics department under her direction at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. She was ultimately promoted to adjunct professor becoming the first female university physics professor in Germany. Lisa Meitner was one of the most prominent physicists of the time despite being female. For being a woman and being born Jewish, she would pay a dear price. Meitner and Hahn saw the success that Enrico Fermi of Italy was having bombarding atoms with neutrons rather than alpha particles. Fermi had gotten this idea from Irene Joliot Curie in France. You see, neutrons are neutral subatomic particles and they have no charge. Alpha particles are positively charged. So when bombarding atoms with alpha particles, there was always a degree of repulsion between the positively charged alpha particles and the and, and the positively charged nucleus of the atom. When Lisa and Otto followed suit and used neutrons in place of alpha particles, they would discover something that would change the future. Let me check this question. Is this the enrichment of uranium? No, so we're not at the enrichment yet. This is just uranium. Um, we will get to the enrichment of uranium in the next, in the next lesson, but um, this is just shooting particles at uranium, hoping that something will happen. It's like they didn't even know what would happen. They were just trying to figure out um, what, playing around really, they were playing around what would happen. They were trying to make new elements and they were looking at what happened when alpha particles were shot at uranium. I mean, this is how Rutherford discovered the nucleus. He was shooting alpha particles at gold foil. He didn't know what he was going to find, but because he was doing that, he found the nucleus. Um, so a lot of a lot of discoveries are the the the, the, the research is intentional, but what they discover is can be entirely different than what was expected. And you also have to be, and there's gonna be a theme here, you have to really be open to what you find out and interpret it correctly. Interpreting scientific data is, is an art in itself. So anyway, so we have, um, we're coming upon the, the, between the wars in Germany. In 1933, Albert Einstein was in California. Here are some pictures of his, of his sojourn in California. His riding the bicycle picture was when he was in California. And here he attended some event with Charlie Chaplin in California. Um, this was 1933 and Hitler was sworn in as chancellor of the Third Reich. Though the Third Reich wanted to make an example of Einstein in particular and strip him publicly of his academic status, Einstein had seen the writing of, on the wall and never returned to Germany. On April 7th of that same year, non-Aryans defined as people with at least one Jewish grandparent were purged from universities and government agencies. Lisa being Jewish filled out the required paperwork declaring her Jewish ancestry 
but convinced herself that this change would not affect her. After all, she wasn't German, she was Austrian. And even when her professorship was revoked on September 6th of the same year, she remained in Berlin, still able to continue on with her research. What would cause anyone to stay under such circumstances? For Lisa, it probably was her love of Berlin, her passion for her research, which arguably she probably couldn't do anywhere else in the world. Um, she made that place for herself over her lifetime. Um, and, and, and of course the physics colleagues that she surrounded herself with. And she just didn't believe that this was going to affect her ultimately, that this would be something that would just pass. Um, so she decided to stay. And where else would a, a female physicist be welcomed? Meanwhile, outside of Germany, Ernest Rutherford in England and Niels Bohr in Denmark took up the task of siphoning Jewish scientists out of Germany. They went all over the world finding jobs for physicists. They, they made positions for physicists and the positions vacated by the Jewish scientists in Germany were rapidly filled with German nationalists. I really should have put this quote on the screen because it's such a beautiful quote. It's from, from the book, Lisa Meitner, A Life. Um, in physics by Ruth Syme. And this is a quote she wrote. Um, it's just so well written. So these Jewish scientist positions were rapidly filled with German nationalists. And this is a quote. It appeared that the vacuum created by the dismissals would soon be filled by mediocre people whose scientific talents were not nearly as strong as their party loyalty. And for me, I think this is the reason why the United States was able to beat Germany in the production of the bomb because the very people that made that happen were the people that left Germany. Um, while, the, while the Germans declared after the war that it was their moral superiority that prevented them from developing the atomic bomb, it was more likely the cleaning house of their German Jewish intellectuals that precipitated their defeat. Whereas Jews compromised only 1% of Germany's population, they made up 20% of Germany's science professorships and 25% of the physics professors in particular. It was these scientists that emigrated to places like England and the United States that made the Manhattan Project possible, or at least most of them. The scientists remaining in Germany made an unwritten compromise with the Third Reich, declaring their unwavering allegiance in exchange for the ability to continue their scientific research unfettered. It was a deal with the devil that Meitner realized only in retrospect. On March 12, 1938, German troops crossed over the Austrian border to welcoming cheers and adulation. In one instant, Lisa's veil of protection, her Austrian citizenship, disappeared. Otto Hahn, concerned both for her and his standing at the Institute, recommended that Lisa leave the Institute immediately, never to return. She was offered a position in the United States, but didn't want to go that far. Rather, she chose to join her nephew, Otto Frisch, and Niels Bohr in Copenhagen. Unfortunately, the Danish consulate refused to issue her a travel visa without a German passport. And of course, she didn't have, um, her Austrian passport was null and void with the, um, with the Anschluss. So it was a catch-22. Her only way out of Germany at that time was to sneak out, having been ordered directly by the Nazi regime not to leave. Yet leave she did. With the help of significant members of the international scientific community, she emigrated to Sweden. As she would later write, I left Germany forever with 10 marks in my purse. That was July, 1938. Over the next few months, she and Hahn maintained their collaboration in writing. And Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann continued doing the lab work in Germany. In one such letter, five months later, Otto Hahn wrote that he had found barium in the filtrate of their experiments when they bombarded uranium with neutrons. Uranium was an atomic number of 92. Barium was an atomic number of 56. Barium was an unexpected product because it wasn't one or two protons away from, 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 from uranium, it was 36 protons away. Lisa Meitner wrote back that the only way barium could be a decay product was if the uranium nucleus literally had split in two. Lisa wrote up the radioactive decay pathway that would create barium and calculated using Einstein's E equals MC squared that 200 megavolts of energy would be released as a byproduct of this split. How was Lisa protected by her colleagues? Um, she, um, her colleagues, so, so many of the people that were on the, in the underground at that time in Germany, well, so her colleagues loved her. So Niels Bohr would visit her and in code would ask her how she's doing, if she was safe. 
they, they kept coming for conferences and would check in with her and see what she needed. And it was, I actually wrote an article about this. It was in the middle of the night that she left on a train and she left with another physicist um, to get her um, out of the borders of Germany. And luckily um, she was not caught. Um, they were looking for her at the borders and and she she was not caught. And, and I mean, she left everything. She left her career, she left her pension. She left everything that she owned um, to do this, but um, she was able to get away. And, and she really only got away with her life. Um, so, so Lisa was still collaborating with them five to six months later. So she left in July, this was December. What is that, seven, five months later. She did exactly what she had been doing with Otto Hahn for 30 years, interpreting the chemistry. Um, so while she got that letter and figured out what it was, she wrote back to Otto Hahn that he had split the atom. Um, she penned the term, actually it was her nephew, Otto Frisch, who penned this term. She called this splitting the atom, she called it something called nuclear fission. Um, and she and Frisch published an article in the journal Nature alongside Otto Hahn's article. Lisa Meitner was later asked to come to the United States to work on the Manhattan Project. She refused as she wanted nothing to do with making of a bomb. Ironically, it would be Lisa Meitner and Otto Hahn's fission discovery that would lead to the ability to make this bomb. Unfortunately, in a history, in a German history rewritten to exclude non-Aryans, Lisa's contribution was omitted. Though the Nazis lost the war, their platform of racism and misogyny lingered on a willing word world stage in a complicit Nobel Prize committee. After the war, Otto Hahn was alone awarded the 1944 Nobel Prize in chemistry for his discovery of nuclear fission. In fact, he had to accept the prize a year later because he was um, being held captive by the allies along with all other scientists in a, in a bugged farmhouse to find out what they, how much, how close they had gotten to splitting the atom. Um, still, so that's him and his Nobel Prize. Still, following the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima, Lisa Meitner received a phone call from former first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was broadcasting at that moment live from NBC studios. Roosevelt asked her a number of questions about the bomb that were summarized in a New York Times article published on August 10th, 1945. Here's a closer look at that article, just a little bit, um, a, a segment of it, um, during which Lisa said, and I'm just gonna read what it says here, I hope that by the cooperation of several nations, it will be possible to come to better relations between all the nations and to prevent such horrible things as we have had to go through in the last few years. Eleanor Roosevelt made good on her promise to bring Lisa Meitner to the United States. In fact, the very next year, Lisa Meitner was named Woman of the Year by the Women's National Press Club and traveled to Washington, D.C. to accept her award. She was seated next to President Harry Truman at the award banquet, at which time President Truman commented, so you're the little lady who got us into all of this. Mic drop. Ironically, the research that led to the discovery of fission had already been conducted and published by Irene Joliot Curie and her husband, Frederick Joly in France. This is Irene, the child on the right. Um, of course, the Curie name here cannot be ignored. Yes, Irene Joliot Curie was the daughter of Marie Curie. Irene, like her mother, did win a Nobel Prize in chemistry, hers in 1935. Marie Curie's other daughter, Eve, unfortunately did not win a Nobel Prize, but her husband did. I can't imagine, I, I can only imagine the competition in that family. Uh, it must have been intense. It was the Joliot Curie team. So this is Irene Joliot Curie and her husband, Frederick uh, Joliot, who was uh, who had worked in Marie's lab, and that's how they met. Um, they're the ones who actually gave Fermi the idea to bombard uranium with neutrons instead of alpha particles. And though they had suspected that they too found barium among the decay products, they failed to realize its implications. It's understandable. At that time, everybody was racing each other to find new elements. So that's what the Joliot Curie team was looking for. Even though barium was present among their decay products, they weren't looking for an element that had already been discovered. Rather, they only had their eyes on new elements. This was a common theme in the research laboratory of Joliot Curie. They were conducting cutting edge research, but often failed to accurately interpret the results they got. But luck, or as I like to put it, 
what happens when um, preparation and opportunity meet was on their side. In 1934, they discovered that, that they could artificially make radioactivity. You see, up to this point, it was believed that atoms were either radioactive or they weren't radioactive. What the Joliot Curies did was bombard aluminum with alpha particles, producing a radioactive isotope of phosphorus. Getting closer to the Manhattan Project. The announcement in early 1939 that German scientists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann and perhaps Lisa Meitner had discovered fission prompted fears that Germany might develop an atomic bomb. Let me check this question. Yeah, she, she kept her name. And I'm wondering if, if Frederick took the hyphenated name too. I, I don't think so, but I was looking at that earlier today. I was wondering if he kept, that would be quite modern. I mean, this was an unusual family, right? Um, probably unlike any other science family ever. Um, so, so they were afraid that the, the Germans who discovered fission would be the first to make the bomb. This led to the Americans and British deciding to keep their research from that point on top secret and not letting it get out to, um, to people who were their enemies. They didn't want it getting out to Germany. They didn't even want it getting out to Russia. The Joliot Curies, however, made no such promise. For whatever reason, they didn't, maybe they didn't appreciate the extent of Hitler's threat. They continued to publish their research on radioactivity throughout the war. Meanwhile, in the US, physicist Leo Zillard here contacted fellow scientist Edward Teller and Eugene Wigner to plan an appropriate course of action. And they were in, the, all three of them were in the movie, The Manhattan Project. As Zillard remembered, their primary concern was what would happen if the Germans got hold of large quantities of the uranium, which the Belgians were mining in the Congo. So we began to think, he wrote, through what channels could we approach the Belgian government and warn them against selling any uranium to Germany? Zillard reached out to Albert Einstein, figuring out that Einstein knew the Queen of Belgium and he could reach out to her directly. Zillard and Wigner met with Einstein early in July 1939 in a cabin in Long Island, New York, where Einstein was on vacation. Einstein wasn't willing to go to the Queen of Belgium, but he did draft a letter to the Belgian ambassador. Using his letter, Zillard began crafting a letter to the President of the United States. On July 30th, he again met with Einstein in his Long Island, Long Island cabin along with Edward Teller, the latter of whom quipped that he entered history as Zillard's chauffeur. They decided that Sachs would be would serve as the middleman to deliver the letter to FDR. Here's the letter. I won't read all of it. This is the letter that um, that Albert Einstein wrote to the president. Um, it says, I'm just going to read a little bit of it. Some recent work by Enrico Fermi and Leo Zillard, which has been communicated to me in manuscript, leads me to expect that the element uranium may be turned into a new and important source of energy in the immediate future. Certain aspects of the situation which has arisen seem to call for watchfulness and, if necessary, quick action on the part of the administration. I believe, therefore, that it is my duty to bring to your attention the following facts and recommendations. Um, in the course of the last four months, it has been made probable through the work of Joliot in France, as well as Fermi and Zillard in America, that it may become possible to set up a nuclear chain reaction in a large mass of uranium by which vast amounts of power and large quantities of new radium-like elements would be generated. Now it appears almost certain that this could be achieved in the immediate future. I'll just read this quote. They, they were, well, so the question was, they were more concerned about a German link than a Russian link. Yeah, leak, not link, leak. You have to remember that, you know, the Russians were the allies for, for, for a time, um, silly as that was. Um, sometimes you have to make friends with your enemies. And so, it was actually a, um, I think it was actually a German, Hans Fuchs, who was in on the Manhattan Project, who was the one who leaked the um, the, the nuclear uh, bomb to Russia. There's a, there's a whole story of of how they could have controlled this, but but um, but the politicians didn't want in any way, shape, or form for the Russians to get the information about the bomb. The the physicists, the American physicists knew full well that it was just a matter of time. And they wanted to prepare treaties and, and meet together and talk openly about it to, to agree on how this, this, um, this very dangerous 
new source of energy would be would be monitored among the nations. But the United States was saying, no, there's no way that, that Russia is getting this bomb. Well, you know, was it a year later, two years later? It wasn't very long um, that, that, that this happened. Um, so, um, so Sachs um, went to visit President Roosevelt, pretty much told him the contents of this letter. Um, and, and the president re re remarked to him, Alex, what, you're, what you are after is to see the Nazis don't blow us up, to which Sachs replied precisely. Following this, Roosevelt summoned his aide, General Edwin Paul Watson, saying, Pa, this requires action. President Roosevelt promptly formed an advisory uranium committee. Subsequently, the initiation of the S-1 committee in 1941 signaled an official trans transition from the investigation phase to the practical phase of the project which leads us to what came to be known as the Manhattan Project. Here you have General Leslie Groves and Oppie right in this picture. So that is the, 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 what I would call the mothers of the Manhattan Project, mainly Marie Curie, Lisa Meitner, I think I have a picture of her here. Yeah, Lisa Meitner's here. And this is Irene Jolio Curie. Next week, we're gonna go more into um, the women of the Manhattan Project, especially the women who participated in the actual project, including two Nobel Prize recipients that you may have never heard of. So any questions or comments that, that you're left with? Yeah, Karen, and you can, you can unmute yourself if you want. Okay, thank you. Thank you, that was a wonderful presentation. I, it just spurred so many questions. But when um, Oppie was first at uh, running his class before they actually started the Manhattan Project, from my understanding, he had nobody there because it wasn't an actual science, right? Is When did it become like the science that they would actually study? I forget what they called it. So, so, so the thing was, is that that nuclear science was a European endeavor. So no one was studying it, and not no one, but the only people who were really studying it were the people who, who left Hitler's Germany, like Enrico Fermi, Fermi, he didn't leave Hitler's Germany, he left Italy, his wife was Jewish. So all these scientists came to Europe with, this, with these studies, with this information. As you remember from the book and from the movie, how did Oppie get his education? He got his education. Europe. In, right? Right. He would've, he would've, that, because that's what he wanted to study. Right. He would not have been able to study those materials here in the United States, which is so interesting that in Europe, it was, it was, it was a done deal, even though, I mean, please, as the 19th century, the tw you know, 20th century, women were not major players in science at that time, but, but, it was it was Europe that that even with all the misogyny in Paris was able to grant a, two Nobel prizes. Marie Curie was the first person in history to win two Nobel prizes and the first woman to win a Nobel prize. That would have never happened in the states at this time. Mm -hmm. There was no place for women in science in the states. Though though women have been making their places, but you had these major women that again, it's not I'm not inserting them into the story because they were a secretary and they helped. These were major players. Lisa Meitner was able to explain to, to Otto Hahn what he had what he had accomplished. Um, I mean, Julio Curie, the Curies didn't know what they had found, so interpreting it was half the battle, and that's what that's what Lisa Meitner did. Marie Curie was the one who discovered other radioactive elements besides uranium, and um, and who am I leaving out? Um, well, Lisa Meitner, the one who discovered fission. I, I think I might have mentioned her twice. But all three of those, these women had major roles in 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 Europe, um, even though they were women. And two were from the same family, right? Two <laughs> bloodlines. <laughs> two were from the same family, which is which which is crazy, but also understandable. It's like you know, you know, I'm going to do a really poor analogy, but how many kids of stars become stars themselves? You're sort of in in that world, you grow up with that, but you have to be sort of brilliant to win a Nobel Prize. Though, you know, for Irene Curie, Irene Curie, excuse me, Marie Curie, who was brilliant, but so was um, Pierre Curie. I mean, they were they were beyond brilliant. For them to have brilliant children, it's not a, it's not a far fetch. Thank you so much. This was an outstanding. 
it's been a pretty exhausting day because as you know where I am, that Melanie in Torrance, I drove out to Simi Valley and spent three hours at the Holocaust exhibit. Oh my God. The, yeah, sure so I have been, you know, reliving um, all of this war all day long, <laughs> plus 405 traffic. So, <laughs> but thank you very much. Let me, let me ask you guys, um, um, how, uh, um, I have another question here. So let me, um, and, I'll, and I'll answer that, Susanna. Um, let me ask you this. What I, what I didn't realize when I set up this on Eventbrite, I, I set up as a donation thinking that you, you could give an optional donation. I didn't, I didn't, from what I found from my friend that you couldn't put zero. Um, um, so, so sh is it better because it, like, if you, any of you interested in coming back to the next one? Good. Good. So, I, I don't want to like milk you for money for it. Um, I, do you want me to just give you the link? Um, how, how, would, how would that work? Well, it's a, it's a minor, it's a, to me, it's a minor thing to get such a great lecture from yeah, I appreciate that. somebody clearly who can explain something that's very, very difficult and like way up here above my brain right now. So I appreciate that so it's fine with me but i will go with whatever the group wants to do so th thank you so much susanna so um so when you say give the link does that mean do another event right or do you mean just the straight link to the to the session and then i want to answer your other question too while you answer this um so the question that susanna asked was how much um link to session okay um Outside, so I have all your emails, by the way, so I can contact you through that. I hope you don't mind that. Um, if you do mind, let me know, okay? Um, outside of leaving out the women involved in the Manhattan Project movie, how true to the facts do you think it is? Well, I, I tell you that I um, I have not read the book that Karen's read, and I definitely want to read it, but I'm, I'm always reading. So I'm reading this book right now, Women of the Manhattan, I can't see it because I'm my background's blurred, Women of the Manhattan Project. But um, I will tell you that the science was excellent. The science was excellent, um, and and the fact that they brought Niels Bohr there, who is just my idol. Um, Niels Bohr saved so many Jews, so many Jewish scientists. Um, I I just I want to write like write a screenplay about Niels Bohr. He's just my hero. His he had a, a, a Jewish grandparent, um, and the Nazis were gunning for him because they knew he was doing this. Um, and and the and the fact that they had Niels Bohr in there, and so I just it just made my day. So I really enjoyed it. Um, I definitely want to see it again. I know that they brought some women in. It wasn't their agenda, you know. It wasn't this, the agenda of the story. I get that, but again, you know, in this day and age, you could expose that part a little bit just because we all need role models. Um, our our girls need role models. Yeah. It, um, when when I was watching the movie, but knowing the stuff about the book. It was like when they would bring different people on and it's like, oh, the, like the person playing Bohr, the person playing, you know, right. other than the totally recognizable Einstein. It was like you were going, oh, I, I mean, it was like I was <laughs> I had like a like a movie star coming into your restaurant or something. It right. was like seeing. I mean, can you imagine all these brains in this one place like who would you have to your dinner <laughs> right you know they would socialize with each other and, and it was sort of like in a way you know going back to college being in a dormitory but only with like brilliant people that you were having fun with and even though you worked unbelievably long hours because they were up against the deadline they were you know it probably was the greatest time of their lives well yeah and it, it at Berkeley Oppie would have or they would have go over to his house so we can have discussions and drink his martinis and right. was just... can you imagine i mean no, that I kind of brilliance i mean i think i think you know i know i know this amount of science and i have a bachelor's right it's like that i mean that kind of brilliance would go way over my head i'm sure or just his ability to oh i need to give a speech in this language so let me brush up on it and learn it and then i'll just give it in like <laughs> Yeah, I mean that kind of brilliance, I mean, is, like polyglot all over the place. Is, is God is God given? That's not man made. Uh, you know, I I don't I I can't even understand that. That's way beyond <laughs> beyond beyond the beyond. I um and the other thing I liked about the movie was 
when I saw Einstein at first, I was concerned because he really wasn't part of the Manhattan Project. He 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 helped make it happen, but he was not part of it. He was already, you know, this quantum mechanics, quantum physics was already beyond him. It was already, you know, it's sort of like, you know, he it was the next generation. And and he played the perfect role in it, just like he did. And and what he said to Oppie, uh, it was just, it was just brilliant. It was just brilliant because it's true. Yeah. Okay. So Eunice, you have to see the movie. You didn't see it yet, did you? No, I have not. And I do want to see it. And and I, I certainly can't do it in the IMAX because it's too late and I'm not paying an arm and a leg. But I, I would, understand. Yeah. I, I would tell you, Eunice, that, that at AMCs, they have like cheap tickets on Tuesdays if you go during the day. Okay. Yeah. So, so that, that's always good, yeah. Well, that's, I spent my whole day on uh, getting exhausted at the uh, museum. museum and oh, that is so powerful. And it started in Kansas City, which was my hometown. I almost was gonna make a visit back home to see it at the Union Station, but then I became well, aware. Was it worth driving to? Was it something that that one should think? It's yeah. ending the thirteenth. So if you want, well, they extended it. They extended it. it was supposed to oh, be. They over. did. Yeah, it was supposed to be over by now. I think. Uh, well, it it's now going to be over the thirteenth of August. I think so. That's still another two weeks left. But um, yeah. my son comes back from camp on Sunday, so maybe I'll wait till he comes home. Yeah, I went at. I got my ticket for 11 o'clock and that was perfect. I did, Then I could shoot for earlier and at least the museum would be open if uh, I got there. But with the fog this morning, uh, it allowed me to just take an hour and a half and drive out there. And got it. Yeah, I guess it'd be closer for me because you're a half an hour away from me. Mm -hmm. More than that with traffic and you always have traffic. Yeah, Karen. Yeah, I, I do have another question that, and I, I'm keep, I'm going to have to go back and look in the book again, but my understanding was at, I mean, Oppie was trying to do this to get rid of Germany. Right. And he was too late, but they were, they were also, he was also involved with or knew about the trying to poison the food in Germany so that um that's how they would kind of get rid of people in there but they were concerned about too many you know like too too uh what is that um the casualty um what is that called the when somebody dies it's just the wow. collateral damage that's it too much collateral damage and but then when they miss that opportunity and then they went ahead with it to see if it was actually working, they had, I don't think Oppenheimer really had an idea about what was going to happen to the people in Nagasaki and Hiroshima to how many people died. And then he got so grilled about that. I, I really, I really, he did become a Prometheus. Right. And right. Is that right? Is that true about that? And how did the women play a part in like, maybe this isn't the best idea to go forward with and. Well, so, the, so what's interesting is that of, of um, the, the, the European women um, did not join the Manhattan Project. Right. So, right. so Lisa Miner avoided the U.S. for that reason, and you know, I, I don't know if I mean, you know, you know, you never know where the French stand, <laughs> in, yeah. in, you know. So, so they, I mean, they didn't even, you know, hide their research. They just, you know, they so they didn't participate either, um, and I don't know if that was a moral choice or not. You know, for some people it was a moral choice. Some people didn't want to use science. I mean, after it happened, I'm sure most everybody regretted it. Um, but until then, maybe they were st so caught up in the science of it. Um, and so in, in this, you know, in this, you know, 
I mean, to have all these innocent people die um, is, is probably hard to live with. And But even after the thing that happened with Curie, when she died, that there, there was no grander connection with what they were doing and the stuff that she was working on with the, when she had got the polonium or. What do you when, mean? When one of the women you spoke about died of exposure. Marie Curie, yeah. Yeah, but, okay, so that was Marie Curie. So there was no connection of, oh, look at what happened when this happened. So if we keep doing this. Oh, I, you know, I think they do. I think they do. But, and yet there they were, uh, you know, and then it exploded right there. I mean, so, so what I didn't, what I, you know, it'd be interesting because it was not just x-rays that were all, so when, when radium was discovered, I forgot about this, people would, would buy pieces of uranium because it would glow and they would get little things for their houses and they'd get them for their pockets and they had pendants that had little uranium in it and they had something called like a, it was not uranium, radium. It's like a radioscope that had a little piece of radium in it and they could look at it. It was like the big thing of the time. And a lot of people started, you know, getting these ra radiation burns. That's what Marie Curie had. I mean, oh. yeah, there was a lot of, of, of fail safes that weren't taken up through the fifties. I mean, I, I, I do a whole talk about Rosalind Franklin, um, the Jewish woman who figured out the, the structure of DNA. She, she often didn't protect herself from all the x-rays that she was working with. I mean, she had a radiation badge, but if it, if it, if it warned her to, to take time off, she wouldn't because she was so into her work and she ended up dying of ovarian cancer. Um, mm -hmm. So this was, that was the fifties. So they knew of the danger. Maybe they didn't respect how dangerous it was, but they knew by then of the danger. I'm sure they took many precautions when they were making the bombs. I mean, they couldn't, they knew they couldn't touch, but they were, you know, they had someone actually, you know, in fact, I know this for a fact, there was a scientist who um, saw some reactor about to melt that, 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 that I, I'll have to get the right details, but he saw one of the radioactive substances start to melt and go. And so he pulled it out of the way um, so that it wouldn't melt down the whole reactor. And he ended up dying. He was, he was in the hospital for a few weeks and he's dying of, of the radiation. Um, and he you know, lost his hair, lost, I mean, so they knew, they knew the, the effects of radiation. It's almost like the, the, from the tour, the guy that reached to grab for the, when the arc is going to fall, when the wheel breaks and boom, he is right. Right. You know, like, it's, um, I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a, a reflex reaction. Yeah, but it might have been worse. It might have killed more people. I mean, I don't think he, he did it necessarily to save others, but he was just a reflex thing, and he, and he ended up dying. He started feeling pain in his hand, and it started swelling up, and it just it overtook his body. So they they knew. I mean, did they live in that reality? I mean, I think they hated the Germans enough. I mean, whenever whenever people say, "Oh, no one really knew what was going on in Germany," I think everybody knew what was going on in Germany. Okay. Yeah, um, and. But you can choose to keep your head in the sand and not and not pay attention. It's yeah. like there are things that ha like if I see a homeless person, sometimes you know I, it doesn't always get me at the core because I can choose to keep my head in the sand, right? Mm -hmm. And this was miles away, another country. Um, how many things? How many? How many? You know, genocide issues are going on in, in this world right now that I'm not rallying against, right? Or how many planes flew over the concentration camps? Right. Right. And or how many times did they go to the president and say, look, this is actually happening here. And yeah. So, you know, FDR wasn't in a hurry to yeah. stop it. Yeah. Um, that's, that's another, it's a story for another time. Yeah. Um, but so they knew, you know, maybe, the, you know, they were so, I mean, for, for Nazi Germany to have happened for Hitler to have had the power that he had, truly the population was complicit. Maybe they felt they had to, that could be, you know, very true. Um, but he wouldn't have been able to wield the power that he had without the population willing right. to go along with it. Right. Well, and there are some powerful videos that you would see there. So I really do encourage you when your son gets back. Right yeah. Time. yeah. 
I'm going to need to get off, but I'm thank you exhausted. again. And I'll be here so next week. Okay, awesome. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Good. I, I sort of like made this plan. I didn't know if anyone would show up. I'm so glad you guys came. These allowed me to do what I want to do. Yeah, I, I loved it. I can't wait until the next one. Thank yeah. you so much. I okay. appreciate it. Any more questions, Vicki, Susanna? Are we good? Rosa? Um. Okay, I'll call it for the night and hopefully I'll send you information about next week. Um, hopefully I'll see you then. And yeah. by the way, there are there are there are being recorded. So if, there, if there's something that you can't um attend, I'll figure out a way to get you. Maybe I'll put it on YouTube or something so you can watch it. Okay. Thank Have you so time. much. Thank you. Good Bye. night.